I, I don't have a cold. What I have is I lost my voice. And it's, it's because of what had happened last night. Um, Matt and, and Liz and Janet and I were at a fundraiser from the Rotary Club, and we sat next to the band. And so in order to talk to each other, we had to yell each other, and somewhere in, the, in that time we, we lost. But I, I want to share with you how, how that was such a great event for myself and for Janet. Last summer, we went to Nigeria, and there we had a pulpit swap with... Uh, with uh, John and T.T. Penna, and you had the opportunity to get to know John and T.T., and we had the opportunity to be in Africa and to be in Nigeria and then to work at Banyam Theological School. And while we were there in Africa, and while uh, uh, Penna's were here in uh, Cedar Falls, um, I, I had the opportunity to visit with a Rotary Club. Uh, I belonged to the Rotary Club in Cedar Falls, and what I was looking for was a, a partnership that we could put in new wells for fresh water in Nigeria. It's, a, it's an often, often, it's a thing that we do as Rotarians, but it's something that we do as United Methodists here, especially in Iowa. And I thought, wow, I could, I could two, kill two birds with one stone. Get next to Liz, please, there, there we go. And put your arm around her and make her, <laughs> there we go. Now we, there's something. But anyway, um, I, we went, uh, Janet and I, and, and um, we were meeting with this Rotary Club, and I looked up and, uh, in, in Jolingo, Nigeria, and, and lo and behold, there were two people that we had known and met before, that we had known on our previous trip uh, two and a half years ago, um, and they sat on the part of the Iowa-Nigerian partnership team uh, on the other side. So we had a Methodist pastor sitting with Methodists in Nigeria, working on a common goal of bringing fresh water to... Uh, uh, to the Nigerians in, in, uh, and such. So last night we raised $9,000 and it's going to be more uh, to bring wells to that. And I am so pleased that we are doing so many things together. Our world is growing smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, two years ago, um, I could rarely communicate with those in Nigeria now because they have smartphones. I can get a reply almost immediately. And we are in partnership with them through Banyan Theological Seminary, and we're doing so much and making a difference. And so I am so pleased that uh, we're doing so much in making a difference, whether we're serving somewhere, other capacities, or you're serving in this church. So, so thank you very much. And, and so uh, Mary, Mary was there last night, and I know Stan's a Rotarian, and so, so thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know about you, but um, I always thought Easter was set in the spring for a reason. I always thought it was always scheduled during spring so that there would be evidence of resurrection. As, as Pastor Matt says, as we are, as would open to these, these evidence of resurrection around us. And I always looked forward to Easter coming because that meant spring was, was around the corner and it meant that we would start seeing green grass, birds singing. But this morning, instead of hearing birds singing, I was awoken to the sound of snow plows going next to our house and rumbling through the, through the intersection. I just can't get over this. Enough is enough. <laughs> snow. There is so much um, in the sense of our unexpectations. In life, and so much in the way that uh, we just never know, and there's so much that we have no control of. And so this morning, um, I want to talk about that which we do have control, and that is our relationship with Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to preach from the first letter of, of John, and in what you find in the, the whole New Testament is basically the word love is intertwined in all of the Gospels, all the epistles, and even, even in Revelation. It is intertwined, and, and many times it weaves its way and it's thread through. But in John's first letter, he uses in these five small chapters, they're not very long, you can read them this afternoon if you want to, but he uses the word love 14 times. 14 times in five chapters in a small little letter. It is really the theme of, of John's understanding of where the gospel was. And, and uh, as, as Matt said, it is in the cross that we see that God turned that instrument of death into a symbol of love for us as Christians. What's exciting about this, uh, I want to read to you 
and help us understand what these words mean. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using the word Jesus because it gets kind of complicated here. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When Jesus is revealed, we will take Jesus for he, for we will see Jesus as he is. And all who have this hope in Jesus purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawless, lawlessness. You know that Jesus was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one abides in Jesus' sins. No one who sins has ever seen Jesus or known him. Little children, let not one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as Jesus is righteous. See what love the Father has given to us, that we are called children of God, and this is who we are. That's an awesome, awesome verse, and it's an awesome verse enough that it would be worth memorizing if there was a time when we just did not understand our relationship with God and God's intent to have a relationship with us through Jesus Christ. Oh, what love is this? What love is this? It gives to us our understanding that, that really love is essential uh, and essential to, to the Christian faith. It is nothing without love, and love is important to understanding our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is out of love. Sunday school teacher approached her class, a bunch of, of elementary students, and, and was asking them uh, a question. It was a beautiful day, spring day, I imagine, as they walked into the church, and, and when they walked in, the teacher said, how did you feel this morning when you walked into our church? How did you feel this morning when you walked in our church? And, and the kids, as kids will be, there were some that, that gave answers that, that were just wanted to be silly. They said, ah, uh, I knew that when we came to church, I'd have to listen to Pastor Matt, and I know my father would sleep, and he would start snoring, and would embarrass me in front of all of my friends. <laughs> no. And then there, there was, oh, they were serious. I, they, they just said, you know, I just, I just love coming into the church. Well, there was a little girl, a little girl that said to the Sunday school teacher, when I came to church this morning, it was like walking into God's heart. It was like walking into God's heart. This inspired the Sunday school teacher to write this to Reader's Digest. This is where I get a lot of my material. So much so that other people have known this story and understand that this little girl, truly, when she walked into her church, experienced and felt as though she was walking into the heart of God. This morning, I, I feel that experience, even though it was snowing outside. And I feel that every time I walk into this door. You know, sometimes I have to chew on you a little bit about talking during the prelude. Um, when the bells are playing, and, and they're playing their hearts out, they have rehearsed, and I get on you about talking so loud that they can't even hear themselves play, and so they start making mistakes. I get on you during the prelude because you talk so loud that, that Doug sometimes, even with the organ as loud as it is, loses his place and has to basically try to pick up and where he is. I chew on you and I feel bad and so I, I want to say, I apologize. Because on the other hand, it's one of the neatest and best things about this church. Every Sunday is like a family reunion. Every Sunday is an opportunity that people come together and they haven't seen each other all week and they, they meet. And I, I watch sometimes as people will cross over to this side or people will cross over to that side to, to greet somebody that they haven't seen all week, see how they're doing and, and, and reach out and, and greet them. Believe me, I am going to miss that. Because when I walk in this door on Sunday morning and hear the talk, the chatter, the talk and the sharing, to me it is like walking into the heart of God. 
I truly see it's like a family reunion that have come back and, and you just can't get people to quiet down because they're so happy to see each other. So thank you. Oh, what love is this? I feel as though, I like the little girl, that when I walk into this room, I, I, I walk into the heart of God. And as, as children, we learn very young, at a, a young age, that we understand that the church is not a building. The church is the people. There we go. Thanks, Matt. You're smarter than a six-year-old. The church is the people. And, and we learn very young that, that you know, I, I learned this before I could read. But this is the church, and this is the steeple. Open the doors, and what do you see? All the people there. Thank you. Thank you. It, and then they're all waving at us. Although this one is asleep, Matt, already, so I put him to sleep, too. <laughs> but we, we realize that, that the church is people, and, and, and it is love that is essential. And our goal as a church is when people, strangers, or newcomers, some seeking the need to be welcomed and encouraged in their lives, when they walk into this place, they feel as though they're walking into the heart of God. And so are greeters, and so are ushers, and, and so are people that attend the, the Welcome Center, those who drive the bus. It is essential and important that we have these places filled, but important that they are people who are warm and welcoming, who show a smile and and help people feel is that when they walk into this church, they walk into the heart of God, the heart of God. John gives to us a, an example of what that love is like. What love is is that our Father would call us children of God, that we are God's children. And so, in the sense, we are related, and so this is like a, a family reunion. But like all things in life, if your family is like my family, we have our, our disagreements. There are, are four of us in our family that are very, very clearly Cyclone fans, but I've got one son. We have one son that is a Hawkeye fan. And so we have our divisions. But I know that when we get together on occasion, we have our disagreements, we have our our. Uh, own opinions, we have our thoughts, and, and uh, when they were young, I used to say, oh, just be quiet. Kids are supposed to be seen, not heard, but now they're adults, and they're bigger than I am. I have to listen to their opinions. We have our differences, but fortunately, what we have, and more importantly, is that we, we have more that is good, more that is loving, that keeps us together, and they are bigger than our differences they are more important than our differences that when we come together, it is like a family reunion. What love is this, that our God would now call us children of God, and that's who we are. Next week, our bishop's going to come and address the issues that we are facing as a, as a conference, but as a denomination worldwide. And addressing the issues of homo homosexuality that basically underwrites our dealings with homosexuality and how we deal with that and how we understand that and how we're hoping to be able to move forward that we, we really understand what love is. But I know because we are like family that it is a very divisive kind of subject. We have those who, who look at the Bible and read it that it, it, it is a, a law that is addressed in the Bible that says that homosexuality is sinful. And there are those who are on the other side who say, so are we, and all of us are sinful. And then there is the vast majority of us Methodists who are in the middle, who feel like we're in the cot in the middle of the firing back and forth of those who are on, the, on one side and those who are on the other side, and saying, wait a minute, why do we have to fight over this? And so in 2019, we will be uh, addressing that as a denomination, looking at where are we going to go in the future. And so we are, I'm just honored that they would consider our church would be a place where our bishop could address and tell us how we as a denomination is going to go forward. And that is so important for us to hear 
where we are moving because it's only a year away from us from us that we will be knowing as a denomination where we are headed on this issue. The reason I brought up our, our, our visit to Nigeria, it is probably the highlight of my career and greatly due because Janet and I were able to share that and spend that time together, but it also gave you as a church to get to know those who were in partnership. John came over here and preached for me and I went over and taught at the seminary for John and I, I was assigned basically to take John's classes to talk about Wesleyan theology and also talk about leadership in the church, how our, our discipline helps us in, in getting leadership to serve in many capacities. What I prepared for was a one hour class time. When I went to school, school class was an hour long. It was usually 50 minutes long and we had 10 minutes to get to the next. So I, I, I got ready for an hour and then I got there and found out that my classes were two hours long. Two hours long. And, and I, I'm a minister. I can fill in 10 minutes maybe, 15 minutes. But I'm, I'm dealing with these young whippersnapper uh, seminary students who are future be pastors. And, and so what I decided was that I would divide that, those two hours in half. And so I, I spent the first hour spending time at an ancient uh, blackboard uh, with, with chalk. You know, I, that, that's high tech in Nigeria. But, but in, in explaining Wesleyan grace and understanding the leadership of the church, diagramming and drawing and allowing them to ask questions and such, but, but talking about what I was supposed to teach. And then I, we'd go off for a break for a little while and then come down, and instead of standing behind the podium and using the blackboard, I, I would pull up a, a student desk and sit in them, and we would get in a circle. I said, all right, let's look at the blackboard and, and see how does this apply, because I want to make sure that when you walk out of this classroom, you'll be able to use what I'm sharing with you. You see, there's a big difference between Nigeria and the United States. There is a big difference. In this issue of homosexuality and human sexuality, all of the world United Methodists are going to gather in 2019. It includes Nigeria and, and the Methodist churches in, in Africa. In places like Nigeria, homosexuality is a, against the law. And some of the far-reaching and, and remote places in Nigeria, they still live out the law to the point of stoning people if they are considered homosexuals. So very much, I was expecting when I sat down with these students that we would be talking about homosexuality. Why are the United States, why are we, why are we talking about this issue? It's, after all, it's against the law. I thought we would get into a dialogue. So I was, I was ready to talk about it and share and to hear what they had to share. But you know what their number one concern was? as young students going to be soon to be pastors, it was tribalism. It wasn't homosexuality, it was tribalism. And they talked about how they lived in their different villages, in their portions of, of, that were separated by mountains or by rivers, in their tribes, and they, over the generations and over centuries, they had grown up to realize that you don't trust that tribe. You don't trust them because they're either lazy or they will steal from you or they had come in many years ago and burn our, our, our village down. We were at war with them. And so these people were talking about what hap is happening in Nigeria, what had happened to us 100 years ago as a nation, as our farm started to get too small to be able to support the next son and the next son as farmers, that people started moving from the farms to the urban areas in order to look for work. And that's what's happening to Nigeria right now. The urban cities are expanding to the point that it's getting overcrowded. But what's happening in the church is you've got people coming from this tribe and this tribe who are coming together into one church, and the pastor is having to be the peacekeeper because they've been raised to not trust, not like that tribe and this tribe. I was blown away. There was a young woman that was in this class that was just beautiful, just beautiful, starkingly beautiful. But on her face, in her tribe, 
when she was a baby, instead of the act of baptism, of walking him with love, she was scarred for life because they made deep scars in, in, that would last a lifetime that made her look like a cat. That is what they worshiped, that's what they believed, and they did that from one generation to another. Now it is against the law in Nigeria to do such a thing. But to be 30 years old and have these marks that forever marked you as a member of that tribe, but also to live with those scars. And I could see, just by, by, by going with the driver that went with us, that they could see and distinguish each tribe even though they, were, they might have been mixed up knowing who to like and who they could trust and who they would dislike and who they would stay away from. So these pastors were talking about the tribalism that, that existed among them and among their churches. And I, I said, the only thing I can relate to that is when I served Gladbrook. Now, I had some people from Gladbrook at the first service, but right now they're divided. You don't want to talk about Rhinebeck and Gladbrook because right now the, the two towns are, are fighting. But when I was there, there were, there were families that would come in from different doors in the church, sit on opposite sides of the church, and, and the Getmans and the Breenies, I, I'm just throwing that name out, I hope nobody here is related to them, but you didn't dare put both of them on a committee because both of them would ensure that nothing got done because if one of them brought up a good idea, the other one would find every reason in, on this earth it won't work. It took me five years of listening and living with them for me to realize what was going on. And so when I talked to the younger people, as the older people were saying, you gotta get more young people involved, I said, what's this business with the Getmans and the Breenies? It's like, the, it's like the, the Hatfields and the McCoys. And the young kids were saying, we don't know. We really don't know, but we just know that we're not supposed to get along with them because something happened a long time ago and it was existing and I said, is that what it's like? And I said, it's just like that. How our church is often like a family where we have our issues, but what we need to see is how powerful the love is, that that love is greater that we have in common as opposed to our differences. How important it is for us to understand that as we try to move forward as a denomination in this world. You see, this world is changing dramatically. And the reason I want to fight this fight is that my kids look at this issue and they say, what is the deal? Two out of three of our children aren't attending church. Because when they look at this world and this church and our church, that we are archaic in our thoughts and our feelings towards others. John writes to us, how great is this love, how awesome is this love that we are children of God and that's who we are and that's really what we are to believe. That is what we are to believe, that we are all children of God and all welcome and all of us fall short. We all break the rules, we all fall short, but all of us are in are welcome in God's heart. For we hope that as people walk into this church, they feel as though they're walking into the heart of God, and that we live as though we believe that all are welcome. Tony Coppola liked to compare God to being like a grandparent. And when I was serving in Gladbrook and my kids were going through the grades, I got very superstitious about what I put in my billfold. Every year they would get their school pictures and so I was always nervous about taking that, that, pic, that last picture out so I'd leave it in there and, and I would leave it in my billfold and, and they would just keep coming and coming and what happened was that my billfold was about that thick. <laughs> Went to the doctor and, and I, I said, Doc, I, I, I'm just, I have this pain. This sci and he said, it's a sciatic nerve. He says, it, 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 it probably is happening. Um, uh, let me see your billfold. So I took my billfold out, and he, and he said, well, it's, that's the problem. You're going to have to make that thing smaller because what it does is putting your body out of line and causing the sciatic nerve to, you know, I, wasn't, I was a kid your age when, when I was doing this. I wasn't an old man. And so I had this billfold full of pictures. 
my kids at Janet. Now I'm a grandpa. <laughs> it's that thick. And it's not full of money. It's pictures of our kids and our grandkids. And let me show you what Terry Coppola is saying, or Tony Coppola is saying, is think of God like the grandpa or the grandma that is pulling out their billfold to show the pictures. This is my Tommy. This is my James. This is my Kimmy. This is my Allison. And this is my Colton. These are our kids. And this is my family. But God knows us by name. God has a picture of us in his billfold. He likes to brag about us. About the love that we have. What a wonderful gift we have. The love of a father so great that we are called children of God. And that's who we are. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we are divided in so many ways. Divided on the teams we support, divided on the things that we, the foods that we eat, and divided on, on the ways that we live. And Lord, it's a mixed up world where we need to understand that love is greater than all that divides us. And what we have as a church is what we are called to do is greater than, than all that, that, that is between us. So Lord, make us one to realize that we're all your children. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.